Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, welcome everyone to Colin Scott. He's uh, no stranger to the area. He went to the University of Washington for his undergrad. Uh, and although he's a PhD student now at Berkeley, he uh, spends most of his time here collaborating with people at UW and living in our glorious area. He uh, does research on networks and distributed systems and because distributed systems are notoriously buggy. He spends a lot of research on ways to find bugs and understand them and ultimately fix them. And he'll tell us about some of his research in this area now. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, so like Jay mentioned, I work on uh, system, sorry, systems and networking. I also pursue research that's at the intersection of software engineering and programming languages and formal methods with uh, systems, distributed systems. So part of the reason that I'm excited about Microsoft Research is that um, there's an opportunity to collaborate with all, all four of those groups. And you have phenomenal groups for people working on that. OK, so um, what I'll be discussing today is my dissertation work. Um, I also have some other work uh, that I'll briefly touch on at the very end, but this is basically um, my dissertation. OK, so I'll just go ahead and jump in. Um, when a software developer receives a bug report for a distributed system, um, they typically start their debugging process by looking at the console output or the log files for each machine in the cluster. Um, and their, their intent here is to try and understand what events in the execution caused the bug, triggered the bug. Um, now, if the system was running for a long period of time, these, these log files could be quite large. If it's running for several hours, they could be multiple gigabytes. Um, so on a lucky day, the developer um, might immediately find some obvious piece of diagnostic information, maybe like a stack trace, that immediately tells them what is the root cause, wh what is the line of code that's causing my problem. Or maybe they can just look at the last few events in these log files and then use their intuition to try and understand what was actually causing the bug. But often, uh, developers are not so lucky. Uh, in these cases, they need to find the events throughout the execution, not just at the end, um, that were responsible for getting the system into that unsafe buggy state. OK, so effectively what they need to do is filter out the events in this execution that were not relevant. There might be many thousands of extraneous events. So that they're left with the, the handful of events that are responsible for triggering the bug that help them understand what actually went wrong. So you can imagine that this, this whole process could be very time consuming. So more generally, software developers spend a significant portion of their time on debugging, some form of debugging at work. According to one study, this was actually, uh, I think this was a study of Microsoft product groups, uh, just a random sampling of product groups. Um, they found that 49% of time at work was spent on doing some form of debugging. Okay? Um, now, some portion of that time is spent understanding what were the environmental conditions that led the system to trigger the bug in the first place. And then uh, some other portion of that time is spent coming up with a fix to the code so that future executions don't exhibit the same problem. Okay. <clears throat> so our goal is to allow developers to, to focus most of that effort, most of their effort on that latter part, coming up with a fix to the code, instead of first having to understand what were the, what were the conditions that triggered the bug in the first place. Okay. The way that we achieve our goal is by identifying Thanks. What we call a minimal causal sequence of events that triggers the same bug as before. And what I mean here is just that if we were to execute just this minimal sequence of events instead of the entire execution, we would end up with the system exhibiting the same bug as before. OK? Now, the key idea here is that the smaller the execution, the easier it should be for a human to understand, the less time it should take for a human to understand what was going wrong. Um, and in general, uh, human time is much, much uh, more expensive than machine time. So the value that we're adding here is that we're saving human time. Now, uh, this is certainly true of my experience in debugging. I mean, it's also corroborated by uh, research in the field of psychology that smaller event traces should be easier to understand. So for the rest of this talk, um, I'll, I'll start by defining a simple model of distributed systems, a computational model, to give us an intuition 
for what exactly we're trying to achieve. Then we'll look at how we obtain faulty executions um, using, our, using our tool Demi, the Distributed Execution Minimizer. Um, you could imagine, sorry, we, we happen to use fuzz testing or randomized concurrency testing to find our bugs. But you could imagine uh, using production executions and then feeding, feeding them into our tool and, and then also minimizing them. Uh, for the core of the talk, I'll discuss how we perform minimization once we're given one of these faulty executions. Uh, and then lastly, I'll look at how well this works in practice um, before I conclude. <coughs> OK, so uh, you can think of a distributed system as just a collection of n single-threaded processes. And each process is a little automata. So it, it has uh, unbounded memory. It's, a, it's, a, it's essentially a little Turing machine. Uh, it starts in a known initial state. Uh, and then it changes states deterministically according to some transition function. And I'll describe what that is next. Yeah? Is there anything special about single threaded? You, um, you mentioned it's a single threaded process. Well, uh, conceptually, if you, have a multi th if you have a machine that's running multiple threads, you can treat that as a separate, as a separate, um, as a separate thread, as long as there's no shared state between the threads. At the end of the talk, I'll discuss how you could uh, adapt this to a multi-threaded system. Where, you, where, but essentially, the, the key idea, the key insight is that that message passing. This is a message passing model. Message passing is equivalent to shared memory. If you interposed on reads and writes to shared memory, you could treat it in exactly the same way as a message passing system. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you can think of the network as just a giant buffer. It's a buffer that uh, keeps all messages that have been sent from one process in the cluster, um, but not yet delivered to, the, to, the, to its recipient. Okay. <coughs> now, the execution takes, takes place one step at a time. Conceptually, we're going to linearize all, linearize all of the events in this execution. In reality, uh, these, things, these processes may be running uh, concurrently, but there's always some partial order that we can define. So conceptually, it's easiest to think of it as a linear order. So, um, one at a time, we're going to each step in the execution, we're going to pick one of these pending buffers uh, to deliver. In this case, sorry, pending messages in the buffer to deliver. In this case, there's only one. Uh, and then based on the contents of that message and the current state of the recipient, uh, it will, the, the recipient will then go through some transition, some state, state, transi state transition based on its transition function. Okay? So it goes through a state transition, and in the process, it will send zero or more messages to other machines in the cluster. Does this make sense? And note here that we can treat timers uh, as a special kind of message. Um, this is just a special kind of message that we deliver back to the sender at some known later point in the execution. So in this model, we assume that the, none of the processes have access to a local clock, or at least we interpose on that local clock. Okay. Um, now, a, a step in this execution could also be external. And by external, I just mean that it's outside of the control of the processes themselves. So a couple examples might be we, if we assume that there is some process outside of the system that we're not modeling, um, it might, we might, for example, a client. We might have a client send a message and, and put that into the, into the message buffer. Or we might have a new process be sort of non-deterministically created. Or we might force one of these processes through a crash recovery event. So we, we force it back to its initial state. Now note here that I didn't, that I didn't explicitly model um, fail, stop, uh, fail stop crashes where, where, a single, where a single machine crashes, because that's equivalent to a schedule where we just partition that process from all, all of the other processes in the system. So this is sort of, that uh, fail stop crashes are sort of implicit in our model. So a message loss is equivalent to having the message just stay in the buffer in indefinitely. This is an infinite buffer. Um, duplication, we could model that. We don't happen to model that, um, but it would be a simple change to the model. <coughs> OK, sorry. So, so a schedule, uh, which we denote with this, this symbol here, tau, is just a sequence of these events, either external, which I'm showing here in dark green, or internal, which I'm showing here in, 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 in blue. Um, and a valid schedule is just a schedule such that at each step, if we were to execute that schedule, at each step of, this, of the schedule, of the execution, the next event to play would be currently pending in the buffer. So it's, it's, valid, it's a valid schedule for us to execute. <clears throat> now, recall that we're trying to find bugs here. 
So we assume that we have access to some invariant. And this is a safety condition, some predicate p, that's defined over the local variables of all of the, of, of all of the processes. Okay? And this predicate will tell us whether or not the system is currently in a safe or unsafe state. So an example of an invariant violation might be um, <coughs> if, you, if you violate uh, linearizability in the, if you're trying to do raft consensus or some sort of consensus protocol. Okay. Now, ultimately, what we're looking for is some faulty execution. This is, just a, this is just a particular schedule such that if we were to execute each event in the schedule, we would end up with the system violating that invariant. Does this make sense? OK. Right, so now that we have that uh, sort of formalism in, in hand, we can now get an intuition for exactly what we're trying to achieve. We assume that we're given one of these faulty executions, some schedule tau, such that we, if we execute it, we end up with an invariant violation. And now what we're looking for informally is a locally minimal reproducing sequence tau prime. And just to unpack what, what I mean by this, by reproducing, I just mean that uh, if we were to execute tau prime, we would also get the same invariant violation. Uh, tau prime should be at least as short as the original and should not contain any external events that were not also in the original. And then by locally minimal, I just mean if we were to remove any single external event E from tau prime, there would not exist some other schedule tau double prime, such that if we were, if we were to, containing just the external events, same, same external events minus E, such that uh, tau, tau double prime also violates B. Yeah? Do you think that all the states of process are known? Uh, sorry, we, we, we assume that we can always take a snapshot of the, of the at, any point in, at any point in the execution, we can just halt the state of the system. We can halt the execution, take a snapshot, uh, and then the user is going to define the application developer who has some domain specific knowledge about what kinds of bugs they're looking for. They define this predicate over the local variables uh, contained in that snapshot. Yeah. So there is some work that the developer has to do for us. I have a question. Yeah. When, uh, when your message handler sends a whole bunch of messages out into the network, right. is that treated as an atomic step in your computation model? Yes, and that's actually crucial. Uh, so I, I'll discuss a little bit more about the implementation details. But um, the systems that we, that we interpose on, we need, uh, we need a well-defined point where the, system, where the, where the process blocks. Like, like you said, an atomic, an atomic start and an atomic end. Um, this, this way we can ensure that every step is, is sort of, this way we can ensure linearizability when we, when we do our minimization. But, but what is worrying me is that that doesn't really match what happens in reality, right? I mean, in reality, you could have, you could do a send, right. and that can cause a DQ immediately, right, before all the other sends have happened, and that can cause that message handler to start executing. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so I think for now, for this part of the talk, where I'm just kind of defining it clearly, let's assume that we're that that we're always we'll always be able to interpose on any point, like you said, maybe there would be some DQ that we don't know about. Uh, let's assume for now that we're going to interpose on it. We, we, we sort of play God, and we get to interpose on any, any non-deterministic event. And there's a, there's a lot of engineering effort that I had to do uh, to make sure that in the systems we were testing, that didn't happen. It's just an engineering question. It's not something foundational to your model here. Exactly. And, and later in the talk, I, I, I fully admit that it may be a lot of engineering effort to, do, to get this to work in practice. So later in the talk, I'll, I'll sort of touch on on the, the, the engineering aspects of this. Yeah. OK. Right. So the reason that we focus, we focus on removing external events in this formulation, um, because external events are the first layer of, ab of abstraction that developers think about when they're reasoning about the behavior of their system. Um, after we've minimized external events, we can go ahead and try to minimize the internal events um, remaining in our schedule tau prime. And conceptually, what this just means is that we're going to try uh, keeping some of those messages in the in the buffer and not delivering them, and seeing if we can still trigger the invariant violation. Does this make sense? Although you define it in terms of removing exactly one, you could imagine removing more than one. Yep, you're exactly right. Yeah, so it, that's a, that's a, it's an excellent point. Um, unfortunately, if you if you try to remove more than one, that's that's equivalent to enumerating the power set, um, and and that's and and that's a problem. So if we had infinite time, actually, well, uh, one nice thing about our algorithm that we use is that if we had infinite time, 
we would give you a provably minimal result. But of course, we don't have infinite time, so this is why, this is why we're looking for a local minima here. Um, OK. And in general, by the way, in general, if you get stuck in some local minima, uh, you could run it again and induce some sort of non-determinism, and we might find some other local minima that might be, that might be smaller. Exactly, yep. OK, right, so now on to how we obtain these faulty executions. <coughs> um, you can think of a distributed system just as an application process that runs on each machine in the cluster. I'm showing three here. Uh, that application process calls into some messaging library, some RPC library, uh, which in turn calls into the operating system to have the bytes sent across the wire. Um, so what we do is we interpose on this messaging library. In our case, we interpose on a particular library called Akka. Um, but you could imagine applying the same sort of ideas to a different messaging library. Uh, we interpose on this, this library such that if, whenever, whenever, sorry, whenever a, a, an application sends a message, we intercept that message before it's sent to the operating system. So we place it into a buffer that we control. And now at this point, we, we essentially get to play God. So we get to choose um, arbitrarily which of these pending messages we want to deliver next. So we're, we're going to essentially linear, linearize the events in this execution. Um, in this case, there's only one choice to be made, but there might be other choices. Um, so, so we record our choice to disk, including the contents of that message. Uh, and then we go ahead and allow this message to be delivered to the recipient. Now, based on the content of the message and the, and the recipient's current state, it'll go so, through some state transition and then send some zero or more messages to other, other machines in the cluster. <coughs> um, now again, we could make some choice. Or based on some probability, we might also decide to inject some external event. Let's suppose that we decide to have this process go through a cash, crash recovery. Um, now be, again, because we precisely control when each, ex, we, when each process gets to execute or not, um, we, can, we can, at any point in time, we can just stop the state of the world, stop the execution. Uh, and then take a snapshot of the local state of each process, and then run our invariant over it. OK? And we'll just keep doing that until we find our bug, some, some invariant violation we care about. OK, so now, now uh, once we're given one of these um, sequences recorded with our tool, um, now we're going to go ahead and try and minimize it. So uh, to make the discussion more concrete, I'm going to briefly, I assume most people probably know uh, what consensus is trying to achieve. Um, but, but I'm going to briefly uh, go over the mechanics of how Raft consensus works. Um, Raft is a particular kind of consensus protocol. Um, so in Raft, uh, we have uh, some, processes, some number of processes in the cluster. And they vote. Uh, the first thing that they do is they vote uh, in, order to, in order to decide on some leader. So in this case, we have uh, Putin over here as our leader. Why are you voting? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the joke, exactly. Putin, Putin, Putin doesn't really need consensus. He doesn't need a quorum. Uh, but in, in Raft, he would need it. He would need a quorum. OK. Uh, so let's suppose that he received a quorum of votes. Um, now client requests will be directed to, to the leader. The leader will mark in, in his log uh, that he might commit this entry. He hasn't yet committed this entry. Um, now he tries to replicate that uh, entry to the rest of his peers. They also log that they might commit that entry. And then they acknowledge back to the, to the leader that they have received the entry. Now at this point, the leader knows that a quorum of the, of the processes in the cluster have received that entry in this, in this particular slot. Uh, so it goes ahead and marks that it has committed this entry. And then it, it tells the rest of its uh, peers that um, they can go ahead and commit that entry as well. Um, now of course, the hard part about consensus is that there might be failures or arbitrary message delays. So, um, what I'm showing here is a particular bug that we found and minimized um, using our tool. So this is a bug in an implementation of that Raft consensus protocol. Um, so the bug here, the invariant violation, was that at the end of this execution, at this point here, um, we had two processes in this cluster who both believed that they were leader in the same election term. So in Raft, that's a very, very bad state to be in because those two leaders might overwrite each other's log entries. They might violate the linearizability, the main linearizability constraint that Raft is trying to achieve. OK? Um, so the two leader, the two processes here, by the way, were the green process and the orange process. And if we look at this minimized execution, um, you can almost sort of immediately tell what was going wrong. So the green node here requests a vote from the red node. Uh, and then the, 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 the red node grants that vote. 
And then later on, the green node requests a vote from the very same red node, and then grants, it, it again grants the vote. So the bug here, and by the way, uh, the, orange, the same thing happens for the orange and the blue node. The bug here was that we were accepting duplicate votes from the, same, the, the very same peer. In other words, we, uh, the actual implementation of this, we had, a, we had an integer that we incremented once where every time we received a vote granted message. Instead of uh, what you really wanted was sort of a hash map that, that, that points from which, which peer you got it from to which, how many votes you've received. OK? Um, and by the way, I, 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 I gave a talk at Salesforce um, with uh, my host was Diego Angaro, the guy who invented Raft. And he said that in his implementation of Raft, they had the very same bug. Um, so apparently, this is not even Diego himself is, is having these kinds of implementation issues. Um, now, in retrospect, this, this bug is easy to figure out. But um, the original execution for this, the initial fuzz test that we generated was something like 1,500 events. OK, so what we're looking for is this minimal output, something that's very, pretty easy for a developer to understand. And, uh, but we're not, well, we're not initially given that and, um, minimized output. Right? So the initial execution we're given might be 1,000 events. Now we'd like to find that minimal output. So how do we do this? One, one straightforward approach might be to just simply enumerate all possible schedules, all possible interleavings of external events and internal events that are at least as short as the original. So the, the original is some, is some point in the schedule space. And we're going to enumerate all of them. And we're going to execute um, every single event. And then at each step, we're going to check the invariant violation. Yeah, oh, very good. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm wondering, why did M have to be so big in the first one? See, you said you got a 1,500 length trace for this thing. Why didn't you just restart um, and only try traces of length 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the, the, the point is that if you do breadth first search when you're finding bugs, uh, then, then your bugs are minimal, your executions are minimal by construction. And, and that, is, that is a good idea. We actually tried that. Um, it turns out that it takes a very long time to get to interesting lengths. So most bugs happen at, at, at least length like 30, say. And even getting to uh, executions of, of, of length 30 with breadth first search takes a very, very long uh, amount of time. Like we ran it for 24 hours, and it still hadn't got past like, length 5. Um, so we just found that, I mean, in general, the, this, the space of possible interleavings is so large that we, we, in our experience, we found that randomized, uh, randomized testing was um, much more effective for, for finding bugs. Incidentally, the MODIST, uh, I don't know if you guys know MODIST. It was done by MSR here. Um, they, they also did an evaluation. They're doing something very similar to us in terms of finding bugs. What they found was that uh, systematic enumeration often gets stuck in these, in these the, only exploring some small part of the schedule space. So they, when they combine systematic exploration with, with random, randomness, they found that they found bugs much more effectively. Now, of course, the problem is when you're using randomness, now you have to minimize, um, which is where our technique comes in. Yeah. Question. It's about the engineering of your system, really. Right. So you mentioned that there is this invariant that can refer to states of all the processes. So right. how, did, how did you actually implement that? I mean, the, you, the state of a process, I mean, there could be stack, and it's just all, all sorts of heap and stuff. Right. How, how does somebody even write that, and how do you know that this thing that you wrote in the invariant is right. first with this bit in memory? Yeah, good question. So uh, in our case, in the case of Raft, our job was made, made much, much easier because Leslie Lamport did that work for us. He said, here are, here are the well-defined safety conditions that we care about. Yeah. So and then and then each process has the the local variables that that are defined by Leslie Lamport or Diego, um, and then we just examine the values of those local variables and see if they match what the safety conditions prescribe. Now I, I totally agree that there. So so most systems, unlike Leslie Lamport's work, in most systems we don't write our specs first. We actually just write a bunch of code. And then maybe we realize that uh, we want something else, so we change our code. And it's just really hard to actually understand what it is that we actually really want. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll get to Retool in a second. I have just one idea there. Michael Ernst um, at, at UW did his, his PhD dissertation on, on this thing called uh, DICON. Uh, it's, it's inferring likely invariants. So this is one way that you could help developers sort of. I think that you read too much into my question. I'm just talking about <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Yeah. How do, you, how do you write 
code that simultaneously looks over the state of multiple processes? Well, a distributed snapshot is a well-known, in our case, we don't, don't actually need Shandy Lamport, but a distributed snapshot conceptually just takes a consistent snapshot of all the local variables. So you, you, what, if you can, sorry, as long as you can look at the local variables of one process, you say, I know the locations in memory that I want to examine, then you can just use that same code to run it across multiple processes. So there are separate questions. How do you obtain the snapshot, and then how do you run the invariant? Uh, I think Ratul is first, and then I'll get of you running it, like some invariants uh, may get violated like transiently. Yeah, good, yeah. And so does your code know when to actually evaluate certain invariants? Um, so if it, sorry. If your safety condition is, is violated transiently, so a safety condition, the definition of safety, safety condition is that it should never be violated. So if, if it's violated transiently, that means that, that maybe you haven't one answer, one snarky answer might be that you just haven't written your invariant violation or invariant very well. That you should. Make it concrete. So I was just thinking, like, take distributed route computation. Let's say a set of processes are trying to compute shortest paths. Right. Right. So I think before the whole thing converges, like, paths are not short. And right. what your invariant is correctness that, you know, after things converge, you should basically get shortest paths. Yeah, so what you're actually describing is a liveness condition. I think that's the, I think that's the, the challenge. Safety condition, but it's still you need to, you need to find as after you, you converge, that is your safety, part of your safety property. After you converge, then parts are short. Right? So before you converge, you just so like how does, the, the right how time. does I'm just wondering, like, how does this engine know that things have converged and now's the right time to check it versus you shouldn't have checked it before this has happened? Or these types of invariants are not checkable. Uh, no, no, I think they are checkable. I think in practice, like it, people do, developers do exactly what you said. They define some sort of threshold. They say if, if five seconds have passed, um, then the assertion should hold. Um, and the problem with that, like you said, is that it can be transient, transiently violated. If, if the execution times are slightly different, then, then all of a sudden we have flakiness. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have a great answer. I mean, one thing you could do is, is empirically build a distribution of how long the convergence times take. And then, and then pick some time in that convergence time, uh, in that distribution that would be reasonable. I mean, it's a hard question. What you really want, I think, what you really want is a liveness condition. But it's unfortunately, liveness involves infinity, and you can't execute systems infinitely long. So, there's a sorry. There is one answer. There's a nice paper called MaceMC. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, the basic idea is that you can convert liveness conditions into safety conditions using some heuristics. So they do random walks of the search space, and they say, if, if we've done n random walks and we haven't, and the liveness condition still doesn't hold, then we'll, tr we'll, we'll consider that a liveness condition, a liveness violation. Um, and that's, that might be one way of getting rid of, this, uh, getting rid of this transient issue you mentioned. I don't know if that, are you satisfied? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you, you said you can do the minimization in factorial time. Before, you said that you, that if you were, if you were given infinite time, you could, you could do it. But actually, you. you yeah, you're right. I, I meant factorial time. That's right. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Which is still, which is still could be potentially years. Um, right. OK, so one observation that others have made um, is that many of the schedules in the schedule space are commutative. Um, and I'll explain what this means. But incidentally, I don't know if you, many of you probably know Patrice Godfroy. Um, this was actually his dissertation work on this topic. So the basic idea here is that suppose we have two pending events, i2 and i3. Uh, they're both in the message buffer at the same time. Uh, and let's further assume that they have different destinations, so they're d destined for different processes. And they are concurrent with each other, according to happens before uh, relation. So they ha they're essentially, they're happening on different machines. Now, if you consider the state of the overall system at some step n before we execute either of those, and then we decide to deliver i2 and then deliver i3, we'll actually end up at exactly the same state if we had instead, uh, as if we had instead uh, executed, sorry, delivered i3 before i2. So we know that any schedules that only differ in the order of i2 and i3 are, will, will end, us, end us up in the exact same state. Um, now, the algorithm that we use uh, to reason about this kind of commutativity um, is called the dynamic partial order reduction. Again, this is Patrice. Um, 
conceptually, uh, sorry, I, I guess I'll explain how this works in a few slides, but essentially what it, what it does for us is it allows us to only, ex only explore one of those commutative um, schedules, and the rest of the equivalent schedules we get to ignore. OK, so this is great. Um, we've reduced the size of the schedule space by some factor k, um, where k, again, I'm being somewhat sort of loose with my notation, but k is like the size of each equivalence class. Um, but in general, this is still intractable. So our approach is to prioritize the order in which we explore schedules within the schedule space. And the idea here is that um, we're given, the user is going to give us some fixed time budget. They're only willing to wait so long before they hit Control C. Uh, and then we're going to try and make as much minimization progress as we can within that time budget. OK, now, um, some of you may observe, may have already observed, that for any prioritization function that we choose, an adversary could um, compute, or sorry, could, could construct the program under test, or even just the initial execution, such that whatever prioritization function we chose makes very, very little pro uh, progress within, within our time budget. And the reasoning behind this objection is actually absolutely sound. Um, but our conjecture is that the systems that we care about in practice are not adversarial. In particular, they exhibit some set of program properties, or they adhere to some uh, constrained computational models um, that make them amenable to the kinds of prioritization functions that we're going to define. Does this make sense? Um, so, the, so the research agenda is really uh, uh, trying to define what are these program properties that we care about in practice, and then defining prioritization functions for them. Um, so I'll briefly go over the main uh, program property that we assume. Um, consider uh, a single process. You can think of the single process as a state machine, um, some potentially infinite um, IO, IO automata. Um, and each transition here is the event of receiving a message. Um, now, at each state in this state machine, we have some set of local variables. I'm only showing two here, x and y, but you can imagine it might have many more local variables. Um, now, consider the cross product of all of the, of all of the processes in the cluster. Um, this is, again, some state machine. Uh, this defines sort of the, the, the behavior of the overall system. Now, let's assume that two, two properties hold. One is that uh, any given invariant, we might care about lots of different invariants, but any, any single invariant is defined over a small subset of the process's local variables. So um, we only look at uh, maybe x and not x and y. In this case, again, imagine that there are many, many variables here. Um, another property would be that each event, each transition in, in, in this diagram here, only affects a small subset of the receiver's variables' values. So in other words, when we receive a message, the receiver is not going to flip all of its local variables. It's only going to flip some, some local variables that are relevant to that kind of message. OK? Now, if those two facts hold, then it seems highly likely that the initial execution, the initial execution is some path through this overall state machine here. That initial execution will define a path that contains loops. Um, and essentially, what we're going to do is remove those loops. So if we, were, sorry, if we, if we were to reduce this state machine to only transitions that only affect the invariance local variables, then that, then that state machine would contain loops, and we're going to reduce those loops. Does this make sense? Okay. Now the challenge, of course, is that we don't know. We we treat the we, we're treating the system as a black box, and because we're treating it as a black box, we don't know which local variables are actually relevant or not, or which events are actually relevant or not. So our approach. Is going, to be, is going to experiment, we're going to experiment with different executions in order to infer what those local variables or what those events are. Does this make sense? OK. And the key insight, uh, sorry, the key insight here is, is as follows. Um, we know one very uh, important piece of information, which is that the original execution, when we execute it, caused the system to violate the invariant. So you can think of this original execution as sort of a guide for how we can get the system to progress through its state machine so that it ends up in this, in this buggy state here. But again, like I said, there, there are, are going to be some loops um, in, that in the path through that state machine. So what we're going to do is we're going to selectively mask off some of these original events and see if we can still trigger the invariant violation so that we can find a shorter, shorter execution. OK, so the way we do that is somewhat detailed. I'll, I'll walk through it slowly. Um, recall that we're trying to minimize external events first. Um, so just consider the external events from that original execution. 
Now let's, let's suppose that we only consider the right half of these external events. Um, we're going to ignore the left half. Now the algorithm that we use to do this splitting between right half and, le and left half is called delta debugging. Um, conceptually, you can think of it as just a modified version of binary search. OK, so now <laughs> we're, we're just going to consider these last three external events. And now we'd like to know, is there some schedule, some execution containing just these three external events that would trigger the same invariant violation? So the way that we find that schedule is as follows. Uh, we walk through each of the original internal events. And we check, is that message that we originally delivered at this point in the, in the execution, is it currently pending in the buffer at, in our current execution? And if it is, let's go ahead and deliver it. If we ever get to a message that is not currently pending, uh, we'll just skip it over. And we'll keep doing this for all of the original um, messages that we delivered in the original execution. Okay? And now at the end, we just check, uh, is the invariant still there? Now let's suppose in this case that it was, it was still there. Um, what that means is that we can now ignore the first three external events. Those are not necessary. Does this require re-execution? Yes. Yeah, exactly. We're going to re-execute starting from a known initial state for each of these uh, schedules. Yep. OK, now, uh, now we're going to proceed with the rest of our uh, minimization. So now we're, we're going to consider just the right half of the remaining external events. And again, we're going to try and find some schedule. Now let's suppose in this case that we didn't find the invariant violation at the end. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're done. There could be some other schedule containing just these last two external events that also triggers the same invariant violation. So um, remember, remember that algorithm I told you about earlier, dpor. D, what dpor will do, will, it, will, it will set backtrack points at each step in this execution where there was some alternate non-commutative choice it might have made about which message to deliver next. OK? Now what we're going to do is continue exploring these backtrack points um, until either we find some schedule that, that triggers the invariant violation or until we run out of our time budget for that subsequence. OK? And then we'll continue this until we finally produce our minimal output. Um, now, there was one major detail which I swept under the rug here, which is that um, it's not always straightforward for us to compare messages in the current execution with messages from the original execution, because we're essentially modifying history. Um, so as an example here, let's look at, at, at one. Uh, we have some message, some message that we originally delivered on the left here. And now in our modified execution, we've got some pending message which looks very similar, except for one field, which is our sequence number here. Um, so let's suppose in this system that, that the, the processes keep a sequence number. This is just an integer that they increment by one for every message they send or receive. Now, uh, we remove some of the events, so now the sequence number has a lower value. But we as humans know that, um, at least for most bugs, it, it, for any bugs that don't involve the sequence number, which should be most bugs, um, we know that we should be able to mask over that message field. We know that, that the value of that local variable should not affect whether or not we trigger the bug. So um, we know that we can mask over that when we're comparing the, the equivalency of these two messages. And, and by the way, the intuition for this observation is exactly the same as the one I showed you earlier. Um, the sequence number in the message is reflected in some local variable at each process. And that local variable does not happen to affect our uh, invariant. Yeah? Is it possible to uh, infer this by analyzing the program? So yes. See some local variables, the relation between local variables. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, another, an, even another thing you might do, other than applying a program analysis, you might also try and experimentally try and infer which of these um, uh, which of these fields are non-deterministic. Um, we don't do that um, for our prototype. We just assume that the user is going to give us some fingerprint function, which tells us which fields to ignore. But I think you're absolutely right. That's a, that's a, that would be an interesting avenue for future work. In general, we want to decrease the amount of engineering work it would, effort it takes to, to, get, our, to get our system to work. Um, OK. So in the first phase, we're going to use this user-defined fingerprint function to choose the initial schedule um, that dpor executes. And then in the second phase, um, what we'll do is we'll only match uh, messages according to their type. So by type here, I mean um, a class tag or an object type. Um, and it, at a, lang a language level class tag. Um, and the, the, the intuition here is that um, messages that have the same type should be semantically similar to the original, 
uh, except they're, they're going to differ in some, some, field, some of the, the values of the message fields. So again, we're trying to stay as close as possible to the original execution, except, except now we're going to explore backtrack points that only differ in, in the type, in small, number, small values of the, of the fields. Does this make sense? Yeah, Rachel. Happens. So, so suppose you don't, you want to drop message with sequence number three, and instead go directly to one with five. Your matching will say they're equivalent, but when you inject it into your system, is the sequence number three or five? Uh, in the example I gave, uh, we're trying to play this message on the left here, but it doesn't exist in our punding buffer. There's only one message that matches. Um, it just happens to have a sequence number of three. So our user defined, the user defined function tells us that um, these two are equivalent. Uh, now suppose that there, were, there was some ambiguity, there was some other message that had the same type. Um, in that case, we're, gonna, we're going to explore a backtrack point. Uh, sorry. Uh, I have too many animations. Uh, so if, if there's ambiguity in which, in which message we might choose, there are multiple pending messages that match. Um, we can, we'll, 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 we'll try one of them now and then backtrack and try the other one in its place later, if that makes sense. OK. Um, so the last observation we make is that often the contents of external messages affect the behavior of the system. And if we, if we try and minimize the, the contents of those external messages, we can get better minimization. So I'll, I'll go over a brief example here. Let's suppose that our system um, assumes that we have some bootstrap message. This bootstrap message tells each process what are their peers. Um, <clears throat> so in the, in the beginning of time, they don't know which, who their peers are. And we send them, at the, in, in our execution, we happen to send them a bootstrap message with, uh, with a list A, B, C, D, E, which tells them the cluster. Now let's suppose that we are going to mask off some of these values of that list. We'll mask off one, and then we'll mask off two. At some point, the quorum size will actually change. It changes from three to two. And now, the remaining uh, processes in this cluster have to wait for fewer messages before they can achieve quorum. So if we minimize these external contents, which we control, um, we can, in fact, get better internal minimization um, by doing this. Does this make sense? OK. Is it the same thing you always? I mean, by changing the quorum size, you might, you might miss a bug. Right? Maybe the bug was only happening you know, with f equals 2. Because you know you sort of hard coded the query of yep. going for two messages only, then they won't find the schedule. Yeah, so we're always doing this experimentally. So in that case, in the case that you described, um, if we tried, we had the original execution which triggered the bug and which had five entries. We try masking off one of the contents, and and everything we try doesn't trigger the bug. We try masking off two. Everything we tried doesn't trigger the bug. So we say, so we put our hands up and we say, okay, fine, we'll go back to we'll go back to five. OK. So um, just, to, just to, yeah, go ahead. Going back to that example, um, so I think to just follow up to uh, uh, Chris, the original question. So there's, there's the process of exploring the state space. You can do that in a very smart way. And you argue that you know, combining that with randomness actually helps exploring a bigger space. Right. But for this particular one, I think it probably would be better off having you know, three from the very beginning. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably find the same bug uh, yeah. if it actually shows up. I, I, I totally agree. So if you're just doing randomized testing, you should just start with a small cluster size and then increment it. Uh, however, if you're trying to minimize production executions, you don't necessarily have control over the size of the initial cluster. So this technique might be more useful for a production uh, run. Yeah. I mean, your technique fundamentally requires this ability to replay executions. Yeah. If you have generated a fault, from a production execution, how are you going to do a replay? That's a, that's a great question. Um, we don't, we, we, have a, we have a section, I have a section in my dissertation which discusses how you might do that. So you need a couple of things. You need a partial order. So you need, you might need a Lamport clock on all of your messages. So you can always partially order the execution. Um, you would also need to make sure that, like you said, that each external event, like a failure, is, is non-redundant. So you have exactly one of those, um, a, unique, a unique event for each external event. So that might, I, I totally admit that that might be hard to obtain in, in practice. Um, we also have some thoughts about how you might reduce that overhead. Um, so if you're, 
if you're, if you're looking at the kinds of systems we're looking at, which are actor systems or message passing systems, um, it, it gets, a, gets a lot easier. You don't actually need, because there's no shared state, you don't actually need Lamport clocks. Um, so we have some thoughts about that, but we haven't, we haven't uh, pursued it yet. Yeah? You assume that the, uh, skipping some events is not going to crash some processes. Uh, sorry, say that again. So, uh, you assume that you're just skipping over some events. That's what you're doing in, in the binary search. Yeah. It's essentially, you know, the first set of events. You assume that you know, doing that will not crash. Ah, um, you're, you're absolutely right that, sorry, that, that when we, when we do this splitting between left half and right half, uh, you're absolutely right that we might have an invalid or semantically invalid split, which might cause a crash. Um, or it just doesn't, it's nonsensical set of external events. Yeah, so, so in that case, we assume, we assume that uh, the invariant that the user defines uh, correctly disambiguates those cases. So if there's a crash that, we don't, that was not our original bug, We'll save that for later. Like, by the way, we figured out a way to trigger a new bug, but we're not going to use that for a minimization. Yeah. OK. Uh, almost done here. So I'm just, uh, just summarizing all of, our, all, all of our techniques in one slide here. Um, I guess you can read yourself. Um, one thing I will say is that um, once we've minimized external events, we'll go ahead and use the same techniques that we use to minimize external events to then minimize internal events. So like I said, that just means we're going to keep them in the buffer and not deliver them and see if we can still trigger the bug. OK, so uh, before I end, I'll quickly look at how well this works in practice. Um, we've applied our tool to two different systems, distributed systems so far. One is an implementation of the Raft consensus protocol, and the other is the Spark uh, data analytics engine. Um, so we should note, you should note that uh, these are obviously two very different systems. They're trying to achieve very different things. They have very different behaviors. And also note that the Raft implementation we looked at was a somewhat early stage development project, whereas Spark is obviously very, very mature. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the size of the executions um, on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis is each of our case studies. So each of these is, is, is a distinct bug. Uh, and then the blue bars here are showing the size of the initial execution that we found with randomized concurrency testing. And then the green bars here show uh, the size of the, minimal out the, the, the minimized output that, that our tool produces. So a few takeaways from this graph. Um, I don't actually show it here, but it turns, we found that randomized uh, concurrency testing or fuzz testing turns out to be very useful for uncovering bugs that developers didn't anticipate. So, that, so uh, this Raft implementation had existing unit tests and integration tests, but each unit test only explores one particular ordering. And there's an exponential space of possible ordering. So there are a lot of things that they didn't anticipate. Yeah, go ahead. Question about the use of the phrase fuzz testing. Yeah. I think by that phrase, you mean that you have control over all scheduling choices. That's right. And you randomly pick one choice. Yep. Right? So I just wanted to point out that that's what you're assuming a lot of people in the industry. Yep. They just think that, oh, you know, first testing is when I artificially inject some delays here and there. I create big workloads to indirectly, not directly, right. influence schedules. Right. OK. And I agree that in production, that's actually might, that might be what you want to do. So it, in production, it might, be very, it might be too much engineering effort to actually interpose on all the sources of non-determinism. So one way to deal with that non-determinism would be to just replay multiple times, flip the coin multiple times. And then, and then hope that one of those coin flips is going to trigger the bug. So that's, that's one way. We had a prior, uh, uh, the first chapter of my dissertation, we had a prior SIGCOM paper on how you would do this for systems where you don't have as much control. Um, one messy part is now you, you, now you become dependent on wall clock time, which is not, it's not a clean way of thinking about the problem, but it, it, it's, it's more practical. Yeah. But you could, in practice, do that without enough in, interposition. Yeah. So. Raft and Spark here are written, rewritten in some language, or you took some implementation and you're looking at bugs that already existed. Uh, what are these bugs here that you're talking so about? These are, these are, so sorry, Spark and Raft were both implemented in Scala. Well, Spark is actually multiple languages. But the, play, the parts of the process that we interposed on were Scala. Uh, Raft is completely written in Scala. Um, so used implementations are already there. That's right. So Spark, obviously, is on. Um, Apache, and then this one we found on GitHub. Um, these bugs, uh, all of the bugs in Raft, in fact, um, were un previously unknown. So all we did was we sat down and re rewrote down 
uh, all the five safety conditions that Leslie Import prescribed. And then we just random we did we did randomized testing, and then uh, for each and, and then and then we checked uh, those five invariants at each step, and then this is what we uncovered. Uh, yeah. Is this a fixed box at the end? Did yes. The, yeah. Then, if it's a fixed box, is it possible to come up with the optimal number of messages? Uh, yes. Uh, I'll get to that in one slide. Okay. Uh, okay. So what we're showing here is that. Uh, is that across all of our case studies, we get pretty good reduction. We're improving the state of the art. So they, they would have started with this, and we give them this. So that we're, we're, it seems like we're helping developers. But you might also ask, how much room is there for improvement? How far off are we from optimal? Um, so what I did here was, again, I'm showing here the green bars are um, the size of our, the output of our tool, and then the orange bars are the minimal trace. So this is the smallest manual trace that I could produce by hand. So it took me, it was actually fairly painstaking. It took me about a month to do this. Um, but uh, it, what, I, what it shows here is how much room there is for improvement. Um, uh, so across all of our case studies, we're within a factor of 5, a 4.6 actually, um, from, from that smallest manual trace. Uh, in these two cases here, RAF 58A and RAF 42, um, part of the reason that we were so inflated, that we were far away from that optimal, um, was that we ran out of our time budget. So what I'm showing here is the, the minimization runtime on the y-axis. Um, and we had some maximum time budget. Uh, but in general, across all of our case studies, we're doing pretty well. Uh, most of these finished within 10 minutes. In a few cases, if we had a better or a more smart um, prioritization function, we could have found our minimal output um, in much less time. So there is definitely room for improvement. But in general, we're doing pretty well. Yeah. And how does that play into the size of the trace? Yeah, good question. Uh, we were in, in this case, we were only running four processes. In, uh, sorry, for RAF, we were running four processes. For Spark, we were running, I mean, they have a master and a, they have a whole bunch of processes, like roughly a dozen. If we had more processes, the, I think the executions. So in practice, the executions could be much, much larger. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that, that there, there are bugs that require even like 50 something messages to reproduce in a full process system. That's impressive. Right. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's essentially, that's, if you think about it, this is only a couple round trips. Yeah. If you have four processes uh, and there's some oh, bootstrapping. And there's always going to be some bootstrapping messages that are always going to be present in the execution. So, OK. Um, all right, so there are many more details that I didn't have a chance to go over here. Um, I'd encourage you to check out our NSDI paper for a much more lucid explanation of, of those details. Um, so. I probably don't have time to do a demo. I have a pretty cool demo. It's like GDB for your, it's essentially a GDB breakpoint for your network. So you get to choose which um, pending message to deliver next. I think it's pretty neat. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, sure. sweet. Um, okay, so I've got a Java program here. Um, this is, uh, I co what I did was I compiled uh, the, ACR, the, sorry, the Raft implementation. Um, which, is a, which is a Scala or Java program. And then I interpose on, so I, I use aspect J to interpose on the RPC library that it uses. Um, so uh, I've got this dash dash interactive that's just telling our tool how it's going to behave. So what I'm showing here, I've got, uh, I've got four, four raft processes in this cluster. Um, and then, we, then I'm just printing out the external events. So we have, in this case, we, we, uh, the, the, the processes assume they have some bootstrap message that tells them they're peers. And then we also have two client commands. In this case, append word. Please append a word to the, to the raft lock. And then this here is just our prompt for the, for the console. Um, so uh, a little bit further up, I'm just showing you this is, this is just the console. This is here at the top is the console output um, printed out by each process. So it's just saying, oh, I'm getting ready to, be, to run my raft implementation. Um, and then now what I'm showing here is the set of pending events. So these are the messages that have been sent but not yet delivered. So we interposed on them, and then, they, and then we get to choose now which, which of these we're going to deliver next. Um, so now I've got a, a little, a little um, essentially like a GDB prompt. I just type help, and it tells, us, it tells me all the commands I can run. Uh, and then I, then, uh, so now what I might do is uh, deliver some message, or check the invariant, or cause one of the processes to fail, et cetera. Um, so let's suppose that we're going to, so the way. All that on 
processes on your machine, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's right. So each of these processes is running locally on my machine, but they're not aware of, of co-location. So as far as they know, as far as they know, they're they're running a distributed system across a network. Um, okay, so um, now let's suppose that we uh, allow the first process to have, have its bootstrap message. Now it's going to set a timer. It set a timer and it says, I'm going to try, when this timer goes off, I'm going to try and elect myself as leader. So let's go ahead and allow that timer message to go through. Um, now, it's, now it's going through a state transition where it wants to begin an election. Again, I'll let that message go through. And now um, it's sent request vote messages to all of the other processes in the cluster. So it's going to go and try and get itself elected. Now, if I had some, if I had some bug in mind about uh, some particular interleaving in mind about how to trigger some bug, I could use this system to try and trigger it. Um, and then at any point, I can check the invariant. And in this case, we haven't done much, so there's no, ver there's no violation yet. But we could just keep doing this until we find the bug. Um, and now when I exit out of, when I exit out of this um, prompt, uh, we saved uh, an, a recording of, the, of all the events that we played. So I could, now, um, I could now, if I wanted to, replay the execution that I had generated here. Um, I could also do this programmatically. Instead of doing it interactively, I could also just make random choices um, programmatically. And one thing to note here is that because we're interposing on timers, um, we're able to execute these, we're run these executions much, much faster than you would be able to in practice. And because we don't have to wait for the wall clock time of each timer to go off. So it's actually pretty amazing how many, how many executions we can go through in, in a minute. Um, if we get lucky, uh, we might trigger the bug. I know there's a known bug here, um, but maybe I won't test my luck. Um, so I actually have a, I also saved a recording of, of some uh, fuzz test that ended up with triggering the invariant violation. So now what I'm going to do is try and minimize the, the recording that I uh, put to disk. Um, so now what it's doing is it's, uh, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's, uh, what I described in the talk is just experimentally trying smaller subsequences of events. And eventually, after about 10 minutes, it'll stop and tell us that it has some minimal output. Now, um, one cool piece of this, uh, sorry, I, I think one, one cool aspect of this tool is that we're, we're now allowing developers to generate regression tests without having to write any, well, they have to write a little bit of code, but without having to write much code. They just told our tool, hey, please fuzz. And given using the invariant that we, that we gave the, the tool, it'll just run fuzz tests until it finds some bug. Then it'll minimize them, and then it'll save them to disk. And now we can actually go change the system. We can go add print statements to help us debug, or we might even change uh, how the system behaves. Um, and then we can just, uh, say a month later, we can just rerun uh, that execution that we saved to disk, that minimal execution we saved to disk. Um, and, and unless the protocol has changed, if, if the protocol radically changes, then that, 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 uh, save, that, that recording will no longer be valid. But as long as the protocol doesn't change too much, um, we can rerun that test to see if, if the bug is, uh, uh, came up again. So I think this is pretty neat. So what is the complexity of this minimizing tool that you're running right now? Well, the complexity uh, in the worst case is in factorial, like, so like we said. Yeah, but we are, are, uh, I actually have the system configured to, to exit fairly soon. So I give it a small time budget. I, I give it a time budget of, well, this, in this case, it'll actually finish in about 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I don't know if we want to wait 10 minutes, but uh, yeah. How large is the Raptor program you are uh, testing with? Uh, Raptor is, is <coughs> relatively small. It's uh, 1,500 lines of Scala. Spark is much, much larger. Uh, Spark is something like 40,000 lines of code. Yeah, but, but uh, you only interpose certain messages, right? You are not trying all the possibilities, right? For instance, uh, I start with the 1,500 lines, yeah. but uh, I assume the code that uh, touched uh, when you execute probably a small fraction. That's right. So, so, in, so uh, one major advantage of doing black box testing is, yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one, ma one major advantage of doing black box testing is that um, the system might be written in multiple languages. Like you said, there might be lots and lots of code that's actually being used. And, and we're agnostic to that. Uh, I understand. Just want to get the answer. Did you know how, how, how big of the Raptor program that is actually involved uh, in this? Um, there was a little bit of work I needed to do uh, to deal with non-determinism. So there are some sources of non-determinism outside of the, conceptually, all we do is we interpose on the RPC layer, and that's it. So we actually interpose below the application. We shouldn't have to touch it. But in some cases, they, they also depend on 
non-determinism that's outside of the control of the RPC library. So an example would be like a, a, a hash map. Suppose you keep values in a hash map, and then you iterate through all the values. Um, the order in which the JVM chooses to put the values in the hash map depends on the memory address, which is non-deterministic. So in, in some cases, we had to sort the values of the hash map to get better determinism. Um, so there was some changes we needed to make the application, but for the most part, we're basically agnostic to it. Conceptually, we're agnostic to it. Yeah. Can you talk about extending this to multi-threaded apps? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, I'll just go right to a slide here. Um, so like I said earlier, uh, um, shared memory is a qu uh, functionally equivalent to message passing. Um, so there are actually some existing, there are a bunch of other papers that look at essentially what we're trying to do, systematic exploration of, of schedules um, for multi-core systems instead of distributed systems. And, and the basic idea here is that you just interpose on the language runtime. So you detect whenever, the pro, whenever, whenever a thread writes or reads to shared memory. And then you trap uh, and you block that, that thread. Uh, and then you treat it as if we had just sent a message. Uh, it's conceptually the same. It would be a, a, some amount of engineering effort to, to interpose on that runtime, um, which we haven't done yet, um, but you could do it. Yeah, the invariant would be defined over the shared memory. Yeah. That's right. Or, or, or the schedule space would be too huge. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, Shaz Kadir has a bunch of techniques for helping with that, that, that problem. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I search, so I'm glad you're using it productively. Uh, I had a comment about the problem formulation. You started yeah. out by saying that you want to minimize an existing trace. Right. Um, I'm wondering if you had set up the problem in the following alternative way. Right. And you just say that I have a faulty execution, and I have a generic tool for doing prioritized search available to me, except that the tool needs a particular prioritization function. Yeah. And all I'm going to do is I'm not going to bother trying to minimize this execution. I will just try to learn from that execution a prioritization function or maybe a family of prioritization functions that's likely to lead to a violation of the same invariant. Yep. Forget about trying to minimize that particular execution itself. Right. So how would you compare that problem formulation to what you already have? I, I actually think your, your intuition is right, that it's, it's very, very similar. It's almost, almost the same. Okay. Um, so in future work, we don't currently learn. So I, I, I have some master's students who, are, who I'm working with who are looking at using this tool called Synoptic. Synoptic uh, looks at log files and then tries to infer, it, learn a state, a state machine from those log files. Um, so what they're looking at is, try, like you said, trying to learn some prioritization function based on the behavior of the system, the observed behavior of the system. Um, so, so another answer to your question is, conceptually, what we're doing is essentially explicit state model checking. Um, okay. um, prioritize search. Prioritize search. Yeah. Um, uh, and except that we have one additional piece of information, which is we know that the original execution triggered the bug. Okay. But that's, uh, that's essentially what we're doing. Okay. Yep. <laughs> OK, uh, I had a couple slides here. Uh, before I ended, um, so this is the technical conclusion. Um, you know, the we're, uh, the results we found for those two systems are pretty. We leave us pretty optimistic that these kinds of techniques can be applied more broadly. Uh, our tool is open source. You can check it out on GitHub, and of course, I'd encourage you to check out our paper. Um, I had a, I wanted to go over a couple slides about where I want to go, where where my research trajectory is currently headed. Um, I've done work on a lot of um, prior topics, not just minimization. Uh, the common thread through all of these is, is, is uh, troubleshooting and, and reliability. Um, my area, my, my background is in networking and distributed systems. I think this is a, an increasingly important area because everything is becoming distributed. We all have smartphones in our pockets. Um, but unfortunately, the, the kinds of tools that we use to develop concurrent and distributed systems um, lag significantly behind uh, with the kinds of tools that we have for sequential code. So actually, this is a quote from Parkinson. Parkinson is an MSR researcher. I, I've never met this person, but they have a they have a conjecture that or, or a claim that the kinds of tools that we use to develop um, concurrent or or, or uh, distributed 
code lags behind sequential tools by about a decade. Um, so I see, yeah, maybe more. That's right. <laughs> maybe even more. Um, so I see a great need to kind of bridge this gap. Now there, there are great, there's a lot of great research from the software engineering and the programming languages formal methods communities on how to uh, debug, verify, um, et cetera. Lots and lots of cool tools. There's amazing things you can do with program analysis. Um, well, a uh, distributed system is just a concurrent system that ha happens to also have partial failure and asynchrony. So what I really just mean, I'm just trying to distinguish between concurrency and sequential code. Most of, when, when you, lots of verification tools, for example, assume a single threaded sequential uh, computational model. That's right. Yeah, and that's right. That's right. I think partial. You're exa exactly right. Partial failure makes things even worse. Even worse. Um, so anyway, the point is that I, I see a great need to bridge this gap, um, and there's a lot of great research from these two communities that we could use to help us deal with these problems. Um, so I have a bunch of um, projects that I would like to pursue. Um, these are just some ideas um, that I've had in, in the last five years um, for, for ideas that we could, where we could take ideas from software engineering and programming languages to help us adapt them. It's not just, it's not just straightforward adaptation. We, just ha we have to um, do some research here, but uh, we could take these ideas and apply them to problems in concurrency and distributed systems. So this is basically the direction that I'm planning to move in. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me. My e email is very easy to remember, cs at cs.berkeley.edu. Um, thank you. We peppered him with many questions throughout the talk. Are there any remaining? OK, great. Then we're done. <coughs>